this morning. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you for the thank you for that warm welcome. Wonderful privilege for me to be here and minister in India again. I, uh, isn't the first time I've been in India. We we uh, came in for a number of years and ministered for other groups and. Uh, that was not very successful. I remember saying, we'll never have a work in India uh, until we get some uh, men that can make disciples out of Indians. And so that's happened. And uh, we have a wonderful thrust of God going on in India now. I preached in Bangalore uh, for that group when we did an open air meeting up in a field somewhere. And uh, this is the first time I'd ever preached. had to preach in Tamil. And then you preach in, uh, they interpret in another language and then interpret it in another language. So by the time they got back to me, I'd forgot what it was I was going to say. So first time I'd ever preached in that. So it's a real blessing. Your technology has uh, uh, lifted you up. You're able to preach in one language and, and uh, the interpreters take care of the rest of it. So it's a blessing for me to be here. I so appreciate Pastor Campbell who has uh, dedicated uh, a significant portion of his life in coming here and helping shape the direction. Pastor Camel is a good friend of mine. I preached for him when he was uh, pastoring in uh, Malaysia also. Great uh, work there. And... Uh, it's a privilege to be here this morning. Romans chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, you'd like to turn there with me. I uh, discovered years ago uh, in working with human beings and uh, dealing with issues that it isn't what happens in life that is crucial to you. It's how you process that. How you process the difficulties, the successes, and uh, the various facets of life is going to shape how you interpret life. I'm reading a book right now called Mindsets, and it talks about how your brain is shaped. It causes your view uh, to be able to interpret the circumstances of life. And uh, I'm preaching this morning on the mind. I read a book, uh, uh, article rather, a uh, magazine, and it was talking about the mental difficulties that people have. And uh, it began to make the statement that one out of every four adults in, a, in America have some kind of mental imbalance. They're able to function and they're able to hold a job and so on, but they have a uh, uh, interpretation in life and their uh, mental processes are flawed. And uh, that triggered me for this uh, sermon I'm going to preach this morning. Because the Bible provides for the renewal of the mind. Now think about that for a moment because this is well documented. There's a uh, book has been written. It's called Switching on Your Brain. It talks about the various processes of the brain. I just this year read two books, one uh, uh, in his own image uh, and another one uh, by a French doctor, which is called Faith Link. They deal with the inner workings of the brain, how it affects your various organs of the body. And so this is crucial that we, uh, that we understand that we have to correctly manage what goes into our brain and how to interpret the circumstances of life. If we do not, then we become twisted in our mental thinking. And so uh, the Bible provides uh, for the renewing of the mind. The Bible talks a great deal about the mind. One of these is in Romans chapter 12, 
And if you will follow there, there uh, verses 1 and 2 is all I want to use at the moment. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I want to talk to you about renewing your mind for a moment from this text. First of all, you uh, need to properly uh, enter. Many people need a deliverance for the mind. I want you to focus your attention on that because uh, you must factor into the equation of how your mind works and how it processes a spiritual element. So when we read that verse of Scripture, immediately uh, it begins to trigger our thinking in the mind, how the mind works and how it's processed. Uh, the Apostle Paul spotlights the mind and says... Uh, that there are strongholds that are established in our mind. He speaks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought uh, into captivity, uh, to the obedience uh, of Christ. So what the, the apostle spells out there, that there are places uh, or arenas or strongholds that are established uh, as patterns in the mind, in our thinking processes. Uh, and many of these are detrimental. Some of these are an obsession that begin to entrench themselves in the mind. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 says... Uh, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it uses the word uh, imaginations in his pastor scripture in that interpretation. I was preaching in uh, Tempe, Arizona in their conference in May and uh, I felt led to preach on healing. And I was praying for a number of people that were attending that conference. And uh, I, I prayed for maybe 10 or 12 people. There's a great number of people that came for prayer. And I uh, prayed for a woman with a deaf ear. And as I began to uh, pray for her, cast out the deaf demon. And uh, then I began to speak into that ear while she plugged up her good ear. And I'm saying to her now, uh, the blood of Jesus. And she said perfectly, the blood of Jesus. Uh, the blood of Jesus. So I did this about three times. Then I changed and I said, uh, one, two, three, hallelujah. She couldn't hear another thing. Then I went back to the blood of Jesus. She had to repeat that perfectly. And so I said to the uh, audience, to several preachers there, this is a teaching moment. That's a deaf demon. Now watch here. And I began to work with her and I said to her, uh, what kind of trauma have you experienced? Immediately, she said, uh, the church that I uh, attended, uh, the pastor pulled it out of the fellowship and left. And, uh, uh, and left. So I said, so you're bitter at that pastor. You lost your friends. You lost the church. And she said, yes, I am. So I said, I want you to pray with me. I want you to say I am uh, repenting from the bitterness and the hatred towards this pastor. And then I again spoke into that ear and had her repeat, the blood of Jesus sets me free. She repeated that. I said, one, two, three. Every word she could repeat immediately it made a tremendous illustration for the audience and also for those pastors, and she could hear perfectly. Now, she attended a church where... Fifteen years ago, her pastor had pulled the church out of the fellowship and left. She lost many of her friends, uh, lost her, and this was the root of that deaf, that ear going deaf was that uh, was that event. 
She probably had heard many sermons on forgiveness, but when that was spoken to her that day, immediately God uh, triggered that. She got a deliverance because that was a deaf demon spirit that came out, and it made a wonderful uh, teaching moment. So what we're dealing with when we're talking about getting a deliverance for the mind, we're talking about a, uh, a uh, spiritual encounter. So let's think about that for a moment because what was happening and what the Apostle Paul speaks about in Romans chapter 12 is breaking the mold. When you and I live in life, uh, events happen to us uh, and we automatically begin to place certain opinions and certain events uh, in a spiritual slot. They, we actually are putting them into a mold that shapes how we're interpreting that event uh, in the emotions of life. Uh, and that woman had the mold broken that day by delivering from the mind uh, because the world pushes at you to shape uh, your thinking in life. Every event that happens, you interpret that in a certain way, and it is trying to shape your thinking to begin to affect how you uh, perform in life. Uh, and God's promise is a deliverance for the mind. Listen to Ephesians 6 and verse 17. Take the helmet uh, of salvation. One interpretation I read about that years ago is that it actually says that. When it says, take uh, the helmet of salvation, it interprets that, get a deliverance uh, for your mind. In other words, the world's trying to shape your thinking, uh, and you need a spiritual encounter uh, to be able to get a deliverance from that. Uh, and there are several biblical examples. In Luke's gospel, one place in the Bible, it tells about the demoniac of the Gadarenes. You can read this story for yourself. It's in chapter 8. He's a loss to society. He uh, runs naked in the tombs. He cuts himself with uh, sharp stones. He wails. He's a total loss to society. But Jesus passes by. As Jesus passes by, this man runs, uh, throws himself at Jesus' feet, uh, and Jesus says to him, what is your name? And he says, Legion, because he had many demons that had shaped his thinking uh, to bring him to that state. Uh, and Jesus casts out the demonic powers. Uh, Luke 8 uh, and verse uh, 36, uh, we find him in the scripture says, uh, they also who had seen this uh, told them by what means uh, he who had been demon possessed was healed. That word healed, it's used there is the word, Greek word sozo. A very interesting word it's used about uh, here is a demonic deliverance. It's used in uh, 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 in uh, uh, Bartimaeus, the blind man outside of Jericho, for him being made well. It's that same word, sozo. Luke's Gospel, chapter seven. It's a an immoral woman that she her sins are forgiven, and Jesus says, uh, uh, "Your sins are forgiven you." Uh, and she was made whole. It used that same uh, Greek word, uh, uh, sozo. So what we're dealing with in the deliverance of the mind, it enables uh, the human being in a spiritual encounter to be able to do the will of God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, which is your reasonable service. And it goes on to say uh, that this is, the, this is acceptable that you could do the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, the excuse that many people use is, well, that's just the way I am. I, I act this way because that's the way I am. But that's not really true. What it is is how the mind has been molded uh, and certain reactions and emotions uh, through the events of life that's been shaped uh, by the events of life in Romans 12 and verse 2, that be transformed uh, by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good 
and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, that you might find and fulfill uh, the will of God uh, for your life. There's a comedian years ago. He was made famous uh, in the television world for using the uh, terminology by the, the way he acted. Well, the devil made me do it. That was a, a catch word that made him uh, quite famous for that. But uh, that's not true. There is no demon that can make you do anything. The devil must capture your thinking so that you surrender your will to his will because the devil cannot make you do anything. No demon can keep you from following Christ. Here's a man had a legion of demons motivating him and a legion, depending on who you're uh, interpreting, it, uh, either uh, 6,000 or, or many, but it doesn't matter. No demon is big enough to keep you from following Jesus. Here this man is, though these demons were motivating and had shaped him, when Jesus passes by, he comes and falls at his feet. Write this down. God has created you with a sovereignty of will. What that means is you control your will. And uh, no demon controls your will. You control your will. He cannot make you do anything. He has to get your cooperation uh, or surrender, as we're going to see before I get finished. Uh, and this is what the text means. Get a deliverance uh, for your mind. Secondly, you need to cleanse your mind from dead works. Now, God has created us with a memory. And uh, memory is a reality of life. And the devil is a master of manipulating the memory. They have in the sports world what they call instant replays. In other words, they're filming a football or a basketball game. If there's a contested call by the referee, then they pull out the video cameras and they get a replay, an instant replay, watch it again, and then they make a, a, a judgment based on that. The devil is a master at replay. You need to understand that as we're talking about this uh, because condemnation is the specialty of the devil. He's the accuser of the brethren. In the book of John chapter 10 and verse 10 says, The thief comes uh, not but for to kill and to steal and to destroy. So here we see, because uh, there's a vivid history of this recorded in the Bible, uh, uh, I want to use Joseph's brothers as an example. You know the story about Joseph? He's a younger brother. He's uh, uh, sent by his dad up to check on the boys. They're up herding sheep. They're not where they ought to be. They're off messing around somewhere else. He goes up, and uh, if you remember the story, Joseph has had uh, some dreams and as he's had these dreams, he's uh, they're all out reaping in the field, cutting shocks of, uh, of wheat, standing them up. And he says to the boys one day, man, I had a wonderful dream last night. They said, oh, what was that? Well, oh, you, you, you're going to like this. All your sheaves bowed down and worshiped my sheep. They said, no, we don't like that. We hate you. Then a little bit later, he had another dream. The moon and the stars, you know that story. Even his father rebuked him, but uh, they hate him. So one day, uh, his brothers are up in, uh, in uh, a different place where they should have been. Uh, Joseph goes up, uh, takes some cheeses and some snacks to his brothers, and uh, they see him come and said, Behold, this dreamer comes. They hate this guy because his father loves him. and He's made him a, a, a coat of many colors. Uh, and so when he comes, they... They get this plot, so they grab him, they throw him into a pit. Uh, you know the story. And then a, a band of slave traders pass by. They sell him uh, out to these slave traders. He winds up in Egypt, uh, and he winds up as a uh, as a, a slave in Potiphar's household. Uh, but in the process of time, you know the story. Uh, Potiphar's wife takes a liking to him. She falsely accuses him. He winds up in prison. Uh, but finally, through the process of event. He's second in command in Egypt. Now think about this now. But a famine comes. And so during this famine, the brothers are sent down to buy wheat in Egypt. And uh, as they come down, 
Now, 21 years have passed by. These brothers have families. These brothers have gone on for life. Uh, but suddenly now they're caught in the events of life. Uh, and as uh, Joseph comes out, he doesn't look like he looked 21 years ago. Nor do they expect him to be the second in command in Egypt. Uh, but uh, a little trick is played on them and they're caught. And the threat of death is upon them. Genesis chapter 42 and verse 21. So they come before this uh, figure. This is Joseph. They don't recognize him. He's changed. Now think about this because this is crucial that you understand this. Eh? Because 21 years had passed by, but they're caught with a little plot as thieves, eh? and they can be punished eh, by death. And so when they come before Joseph, listen to this, but Genesis 42, 21. Then they said to one another, We are truly guilty concerning our brother. For we saw the anguish of the, his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. Now think about this, because this is conscience now. 21 years has passed by. They have families. Life is going on. But in the crisis time of life, suddenly conscience comes surging to the future like fingers through a wet paper towel and immediately as they got a problem their conscience said the reason this is happening to us is because we sold our brother and we wouldn't hear his cries uh, because uh, the devil will exploit uh, the events of life uh, and this is what the instant replay brings so conscience is a powerful, powerful thing. God gives each of us a conscience. A guilty conscience must be atoned for. Write that down somewhere. This is one of the most important things you'll ever hear about conscience. A guilty conscience must find atonement. Unless we have God's atonement, which is only by the blood, we will either have a twisting of our mental processes We'll develop mental uh, derangement. We may uh, uh, develop uh, an imbalanced emotion. Or, the worst of all, we may develop diseases in our body. Because sin and guilt must be atoned for to properly process it. And so it's important that you know that. So here's the miracle that every person needs uh, is a cleansing uh, of their conscience sin transformed by the renewing of your mind. Ephesians 4, 22 and 23 says that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, God has that process. He can cleanse the mind. This is called, in Hebrews, purging of your conscience. Hebrews 9, 13 and 14, For if the blood of bulls uh, and of goats and the ashes of a heifer, uh, sprinkling the unclean, uh, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, uh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience uh, from dead works uh, to serve uh, the living God? It uses the word... Uh, uh, in the New King James uh, cleanse, but it's purge uh, in the King James. So let's ponder this for a moment because this is clearly in the Bible. In the book of First John, it says in uh, chapter First John 1, verse uh, 6, uh, or 8 rather, uh, let no one say uh, uh, that, uh, that he's not committed sin. Let no one say that. But... Uh, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just uh, to cleanse us from sins uh, and uh, to make us whole in our mind. That's 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. So let's think for a moment about this word clean. Say clean with me. Say it again. Right, think about that for a moment. I was uh, looking out my uh, hotel window this morning while I was waiting and I saw buzzards, they're circling. You know, when buzzards circle, that means that something's dead down there. No one said, they can, they can smell 
a dead carcass. It, this might have been a dead carcass, but they're circling. So I said, there's a wooded area down there. I said, there's something that's dead down there, and that's why they're circling. And so that's what happens to a guilty conscience. Uh, Titus 1 and verse 15 and 16, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. So in this text that we're using, we're seeing the word corruption. Uh, we are, in some of these scriptures, defiled. Uh, one verse talks about abominable. And it's, it's, uh, it's giving us a picture of something that's rotting. A guilty conscience doesn't just remain neutral. It continues to degenerate. And this is why we must have the renewing of our conscience. Uh, or in the process of time, many times it grows worse and worse and worse. And I uh, am always thinking, I'm observing human beings. I've pastored now uh, for some uh, 65 years. Uh, and uh, I watch people in the process of life, uh, and people who do not process life correctly, they grow worse and worse and worse. And the older they get, uh, the worse uh, that they get. Only God can cleanse the conscience. Uh, in Titus chapter 3 uh, and verse 5, says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us, uh, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So we must find a cleansing for the conscience. That brings us then to the gateway uh, to a renewed mind. Let's think about that for a moment. How do we get uh, a renewed mind? The gateway is repentance. Think about that for a moment because this is the key to a mind uh, being renewed. I brought a pastor back from some years ago. Uh, for uh, failure, and he's in the he's in the congregation. I'm working with him. I'm trying to get him restored, and I've talked to him several times. And it's a study of human nature to recall, because uh, here's this man, and uh, he wants to excuse his own failure. But I want to you know when we fail, it's our fault. Can you say Amen? I said very clearly, the devil can't make you do anything. He has to get your cooperation. And uh, uh, and this man was a study in human nature. I, he said to me, I've gone too far. That uh, That's a problem. Uh, and uh, I, I'm setting, what, what, I, what I call this is, is the pastor's brain wrestling. You know what wrestling is? How many of you know what wrestling is? Let me see your hand. Okay, you've been watching TV. I can see that. So <laughs> it's okay. I'm not giving an altar call right now. And so I call this brain wrestling. Uh, occasionally, I will sit down and be counseling someone, and I'm brain wrestling with them, trying to get them to come to grips with reality. And after an hour talking with them, I'm crazier than they are. So let's think about this for a moment, because uh, the brain has certain tracks and certain processes. Uh, and when a person repents, they become a different person. This man would wrestle with me, I think, maybe five years. But suddenly, he repented. And when he did, no more wrestling. Immediately, he's a different man. And humility is the trigger point to repentance. Think with me for a moment, because uh, here we need to examine this in light of the Scriptures. In this text that I read, it says, uh, present yourselves uh, unto God. What that is is a surrender to God. We've got a pastor. Uh, he was raised in church, and his father backslid. When his father backslid, he taught him how to smoke marijuana. He's 13 years old. So here's this young man. He grows up in and out, in and out, in and out, uh, a uh, pattern of living for God has not been set for him, an excuse and all that, but occasionally he'd come in and he'd answer an altar call and he'd come to two or three services and then he'd disappear again. And about five years ago, 
This young man came in, answered an altar call, and suddenly he got it. Pastor Greg Mitchell asked him after about a year. He's solid. After a sermon, he'd come with his Bible. What does this mean? At breakfast, he'd ask questions about the Scripture. He's out pastoring right now, pioneering a church. Been out for two years. He asked him, he said, Justin, what made the difference? He said, I surrendered. That's what this Bible says. Uh, Present your bodies a living sacrifice to God. That's a surrendering to the will of God. Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, that's your life, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, the reason the apostle says that this is the only thing that makes any sense. So think with me concerning this uh, business of repentance. God's mercy is engaged the moment that you surrender to God. Romans chapter uh, 2 and verse 4 says, Or do you despise the riches of God's goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, and knowing that the goodness of God leads you to uh, repentance? Now think about that for a moment. Because repentance often is uh, interpreted as a change of mind. I read uh, one, uh, one uh, writer says, Repentance is not changing your mind. It's your mind being changed. Let's think about the prodigal son. Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. You know the story? Uh, he comes to his father, said, Father, divide me the portion of goods that belongs to me. Uh, he took his inheritance. He goes out. He wastes his uh, inheritance with righteous living among prostitutes. Uh, and he does what all backsliders experience. Uh, finally, we find him in a pig pen. He's feeding pigs. And he grows so desperate, he's eating the pig's, feet, uh, pig's food. But in Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, and I think it's verse 17, it says, he came to himself. Now think about that for a moment, because here's his mind uh, being changed. The Jewish rabbis, they interpret uh, uh, repentance as, uh, uh, as uh, uh, after madness because anyone who would rebel against God is crazy. So let's ponder this for a moment uh, because uh, God's word uh, captivating our minds uh, is able to bring to pass a humility whereby we surrender ourselves to God and 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, For God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That word sound is a healthy or a disciplined mind. The Word of God says, uh, Let the Word of God dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. James uh, talks about this as the engrafted word. So now we're talking about God's word. I've read to you this morning from God's word because God's word is God's self-revelation to mankind. It can heal. Can you say amen? It can heal the emotions. It can heal the mind. It can heal the body. It is God's answer. And when he says the engrafted word, he gives us an image from agriculture. They often will take a tree and they will make a slice in the tree, take a limb from another kind of fruit, put it on there, bind it up, and in God's miracle of nature, it'll take on the life of that, uh, of that uh, uh, root and tree and begin to bear fruit. And so when he says the engrafted word, it means it's you and I who by nature are sinners. Can you say amen? But if we'll take God's word and begin to make it a part of our life, it's like a, a grafting. It becomes a part of our nature, and we begin to bear the fruit. But we have to make a decision that we're going to believe God. I was pastoring in Australia uh, probably in 1980, 81. I had a man come to me, and he said, Pastor, can, can you help me? He says, my mind is all over the map. Uh, I, tr I try to read the Word of God, and it wanders off here. Uh, I try to uh, 
think and uh, and my mind is wondering all the can you help me? I said, yes, I can. First Peter 1 verse 13 says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and uh, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is uh, to be brought to you at the revelation uh, of Jesus Christ. Now, there's an imagery again. In Bible days, they wore long uh, dress, long war, ro ro uh, robes, uh, often that went down, uh, draped over their whole. Uh, but it, when they were going to go into warfare, or they were going into battle, or they were going to go to work, they would take a belt or a sash, uh, pull it up, and tie it around so that it no longer was a hindrance. So here's a tremendous imagery, because our minds uh, are susceptible to the winds of doctrine. Can you say amen? Every six months or so, a wind of doctrine blows through the church. Some uh, rabbi gets a new revelation that no one's heard about for 2,000 years. And, wow, man, I, that's well, fantastic. But it's not fantastic. It's a wind of doctrine blowing through. The Bible says uh, that uh, you're susceptible to. So I said to this man, uh, bow your head with me. He bowed his head with me. And I said, now... Think in your mind that you're picking up a shovel. Put your hands around that shovel. Okay. Now put it on the ground and put your foot on it and push it in. And he went through the motions like he was doing a real shovel. And throw that dirt off to the side. He did this. He did that two or three times. And I said, now, isn't it interesting that you did exactly what I told you to do? And you're able to do that. God's word, son... It's exactly that way. It'll tell you how to live. It'll tell you how to get deliverance. It'll tell you how to get healed. It'll tell you how to serve God. But you must obey that. And he said, wow, I never have heard that before in my life. I always thought that any kind of thought that came into my mind, I let it go like a wind of doctrine or like some emotion. And I've never heard that. Uh, last year, I was back in Australia again. And this man's still serving God. And I asked him, I said, how's the, how's the mind working? He said, just fine. Ever since I went through that uh, exercise with you, uh, it's fine. So the Bible says uh, that God has given us a mind. The devil does not control our mind. We control our mind. You can close your eyes right now, and you could follow any thought that I would put in your mind uh, that's exactly like the devil does through false teachers, uh, through people who want to uh, harm us, who want to shape our thinking, through books that we read, uh, through newspapers, through sermons that we hear. Our minds are shaped as we give wind to or give thought to it. If you're a soldier training for the military, they will put you through certain kinds of exercise. I remember when I was in the U.S. military. Uh, they put us in uh, boot camp and training, and uh, they uh, they ran us through a uh, exercise with gas masks. And so we had these gas masks, uh, and they said, "Okay, we give a command, put those gas masks on." We put the gas masks on. Then they ran us through a chamber that was filled with gas. It was tear gas, and if you didn't have your mask on right. You came out weeping. They were training us. They did the same with bullets. Uh, make soldiers crawl on the ground underneath barbed wire while live bullets are being fired over them. The reason for this is in combat, uh, a soldier must keep his mind focused. So it is uh, when the bullets are flying, when he's in warfare, chaos is everywhere. He must keep his mind focused uh, on the danger that's there and conduct himself in a certain way to be able to come out with victory. So it is uh, with a Christian soldier. Because you and I are in an arena, a spiritual arena. Can you say amen? And in that spiritual arena, there are demonic powers, there are false teachers, uh, there's false brethren, there's false doctrine, there's emotional assault and so on. Unless you're able to keep your mind focused uh, on the things of God, uh, the events of life will shape your mind 
in the direction. Temptations to lust, temptation to dishonesty, temptation to disobedience. Uh, the world and the devil is constantly trying to put us in a mold uh, and shape our thinking uh, so that they govern how we come out. Uh, but the Bible says uh, every believer has the mind of Christ or can have the mind of Christ. Uh, but the decision is made uh, by you. I want every head bowed. I want every eye closed. No, we're on.